Well, hello everyone. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. I've got two people with me today who are going to talk about the online MBA program, and I might say the newly overhauled, completely redone online MBA uh, at Northeastern University's Damore McKim uh, Business School. Uh, we have Kate Klepper in the house, Associate Dean of Graduate Business Programs uh, at the school. We have Mark Doxter, the Professor of Practice in Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So I know because I've been up there talking to a whole bunch of folks at Northeastern that uh, you took out a white sheet of paper and completely redid your online MBA program. So let's talk a little bit about what you did, why you changed it, and what it's like today. Because you were a pioneer in the online MBA space. Right, Kate? That's right. That's right. Thanks, John. Um, I like to think of it as it might have been a legal pad size sheet of paper that we started with um, and may or may not have had lines. I can't confirm or deny. But I will say what we did is we really took a look at the fact that, yes, we've been in the online MBA space since 2006. So we were, you know, if not the first, one, among the first early adopters in this space. And I think we did a really nice job at the time delivering a state-of-the-art program. But as all of us know, nothing stays the same, right? And so it's 2006 to today, even to, you know, a couple of years ago, the tremendous change even before the pandemic that forced all of us to rethink how we do lots of things, we were looking at what do we do next? How do we take a program that's grounded in everything that speaks to Northeastern's core competencies like experiential learning and really putting students in the shoes of the protagonist in the case and help them learn not just theory, but application? How do we do that online? Um, so we, we brought together a team of faculty, as these things do, right, and, and created a task force and looked at the landscape and saw what a lot of people had been adding to the online marketplace. And there are some great options out there, um, not as great as what we've come up with, but great options out there nonetheless, and said, well, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do what somebody else has done. We want to do what only we can do and what we can do what we believe better than anyone else. And that is to really dig deep and double down on the experiential aspects. It's what Northeastern is known for. It's our core competency. Um, it has proven itself as a tremendous learning opportunity for over a hundred years. The challenge is how do you do that with working professionals who are fully ensconced in their work and distributed all over the country and all over the world? Um, I personally couldn't answer that question, but that's why we brought Mark along. <laughs> he's he's really helped us develop the experiential portion of the program. And before I take a breath, let me also say the other things that we thought were really critical to our program redesign beyond the experiential are it needs to be flexible. Understanding that our market is made up of working professionals who sometimes things change. Life gets in the way, work gets in the way. And sometimes you can go full, full tilt and take multiple courses. And sometimes you need to tap the brakes and pay attention to other things. So we really needed flexibility to be a cornerstone of our program. And then finally, the third pillar is we have been hearing loudly and clearly from our students and our corporate partners that social responsibility and societal challenges are hugely important. And we hadn't done enough in that space. So how do we bring that to the forefront as well? And now I'll take a breath and let, let you ask another question or let Mark respond. Yeah, <laughs> and and I, I should put out there, because not everyone knows uh, all the background here uh, about Northeastern even, because you know a lot of the school success um, hails from its co-op program, where students at the university actively engage in the world of work before they graduate, and it gives them a real head start. And this is why the university overall and the business school uh, have elevated experiential learning uh, to an important level. And so bringing this up and doubling down on it in the online MBA program is a big deal. 
And it certainly reinforces or, or it goes back to the roots of the university and the success. Uh, so I went, Absolutely. Yeah. So, so Mark, I wonder if you could uh, give us a little more detail on when we say experiential, what do we really mean and how does it play out in the new design? Awesome. So you know, we've used a couple of different ways to describe this experience powered, um, experiential, you know, different terms. And, and look, everybody is using experiences to help to, to drive a course. One of the things that we're doing that's a bit different is that we are having the course surround the exact experience, the project, um, what decision needs to be made. And what we're trying to do is empower people to understand the tools that they can use to analyze what's going on, but then actually apply them in a real world problem. And that's their mission for the course. They need to do this with other people who also are facing the same constraints and, and need that same flexibility, but they all need to work together. And one of the things that I've been reinforcing to students is whatever you do, no matter where, when, why, how, you need to be able to work with and influence other people. We're giving them that kind of spot on experience. What we're doing also is we're bringing in from the outside CEOs and chief, I'll call them CXOs, chief officers leading the C-suite who've made these decisions, who are in the role of getting all the information from their teams and having to make a decision and letting them give feedback to the students, not just at the end during kind of a judging competition, but in the process as they're building the case, as they're exploring different areas. Now, look, it's not the kind of the technical expertise kinds of things we're looking for here, but we're living in a world that is going to be characterized by constant change. I think Heraclitus first said this, if you go back a couple hundred years BC, in terms of when this discussion of change started, it seems to be accelerating, in my opinion. <laughs> Everything has changed, lots of once in a hundred year activities. We want students to have not just a toolkit that they can use, but to have had a chance to think about it, to put it together into practice, to get feedback from real people who had those experiences, who can help them kind of think about, oh, you know, how does that work? I can give you a very concrete example. We just did um, a course where we did some of the, this uh, experience-powered learning, and I got feedback from one of the students who is a very kind of CFO kind of person or financially oriented person. And we gave each student in this project, we told them, you're, you are this member of the C-suite. This particular person was the chief people officer. And she initially said, oh, I'm really disappointed. I'm a financial person and I got the people role. <laughs> and by the end, she came back and said, wow, I get it now. I never would have had this perspective. I never would have understood what was going on from that side. And it just kind of brought it home in terms of how they did the work. Um, and I think one of the things that we got for feedback also is people said, give me more. This was a lot of fun. Give me more. Um, I took that as a positive. <laughs> and Mark, in that case, was it a real life challenge uh, faced by an organization that they were working on? Or was it a case challenge kind of thing? No, no, this is a real life challenge. I will give you just a little bit of the specific. What we did is we empowered this team. Their project for the course was you are working for a convenience store chain. Should you bring in one of these cashierless technologies, specifically Amazon's Just Walk Out technology? Yes or no, and why? Go. <laughs> we brought in um, all sorts of different perspectives. We brought in companies that had just implemented this technology. And we actually created bonus content so that if the students accomplished the task they were supposed to when they were supposed to, they got access to an interview. And we interviewed this person and not only said, how'd it go? Why'd you make the decision? But we asked the, the kid a critical question in my view, which is, if you got to do it again, what would you do differently? Ah, right. And armed with that, they were able to come back. They presented to, in fact, in this one, I had um, two CEOs who gave them feedback during their progress in putting together their recommendation and guided them on areas where as CEO, the CEO is saying, I need more about this. You haven't talked enough about this. Bring in more of that before you come back to me. We even had a situation where a group was given a certain amount of time and they exceeded it vastly. And they got some pretty sharp feedback from their CEO explaining that's not how it works. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. you need to convince me on that first meeting and get to the second meeting. So it, it um, I thought it was a great experience and students loved it. Yeah, and in online MBA programs, uh, people tend not to get that kind of experience, which makes it all that more special. Now, Kate, I want to come back to you because I want to get the nuts and bolts of the program. <laughs> okay, How long it takes to complete, what you could expect to do in a given week, what the typical class size is. You mentioned flexibility. Give us an idea of how flexible the program is in terms of how long you can take to complete it and how short. Um, give us a general... Uh, nuts and bolts. You bet. You bet. So the program can be completed um, in 18 months. And if you're really a narcissist, you could probably do it faster than that. We don't necessarily recommend it um, because again, we're, we're targeting people who are fully employed uh, and, and we think there are other things. We, you're a much more interesting student if you have other things in your life besides just school. So it can be completed in 18 months at a reasonable pace, um, and students can go longer. They can take up to three years um, should they need more time. And then if we have to, we'll, we'll talk if you need more than that. There are other things going on, but really that's, that's what we see has been. And in our former program, that was about the average. Three years was about the average to complete. We anticipate students will complete this program more rapidly than they did the former program. Um, our courses are half-term courses. So the expectation is students are fully engaged when they're enrolled in a course. But that also means that if you want to take one class at a time, it's actually two classes in the confines of a traditional semester. So it allows you to click through and continue to make progress towards completion even at a fairly modest pace. But in a half-term course, you're busy, right? There, there are deliverables. You are meeting, meeting with your team, getting new content, have things that need to be done on a weekly basis. This is not a course where you can go in week one, download the syllabus, and simply mail in, you know, read the chapters on your own, if you will, and, and mail back. Uh, your responses to the quiz questions. That, that's not going to work. There is tremendous engagement with your learning team, with your faculty member. Um, and the classes, the way, the way it works is it's really quite scalable. So your experience as a learner when you have a lecture, right, and content delivery is shared with any number of people. But then there are sessions every week where you can meet with the professor, you can meet with um, others in your group and really have a much more personal experience. And what we have found happens is students will gravitate towards classmates who are completing the program at a similar pace, not unlike what happens in a traditional campus bound part-time MBA program or evening MBA program. You start to see people in the same, in your courses you're in, taking them about the same pace, you find your people, you know, water seeks its level, if you will, and that becomes part of your network. There mm -hmm. are obviously, not obviously, but there are opportunities for students to network more broadly, whether it's, you know, through social engagements. In fact, um, I'll be in New York City Thursday evening for a networking event where we've invited students from campus and online and our alumni in the area to meet. So, and I've said this to you before, John, and I believe this to my core, an online MBA student is a DeMore McKim student, modality agnostic. So there are lots of opportunities to engage with us, to engage with each other, with our corporate partners, with fellow alumni. Um, and then, yeah, it becomes part of your life. I always encourage students, especially working professional students, that once you start, just keep going. It's hard to fit something new into your already busy life. But once you figure it out, how to cram it in, don't stop. Because it's really easy for something else to take up that space. If you take, if you stop and it's hard to get back into it. And, and that's just because we're busy. People are busy and everyone's expecting more. So once you figure out that rhythm and what works for you and the cadence that works for you, I encourage you, like, even if you have to go from two classes down to one, just keep going and keep making progress. Now, Kate, in the world of online learning, there are two phrases that come up frequently, asynchronous and synchronous. 
Now, does this program have both elements or not? It does. It does. It does. Much of the, um, I would, what I would call content delivery is asynchronous. So if Mark is teaching his course, his lectures will be recorded and you can access them at a certain time. They'll be available and then they're available to you again and again and again because it will be so content rich and dense that you're not going to get everything the first time, right? So you right. can go back and re-listen. Re but then there's an opportunity to actually sit in a meeting room, an online meeting room with Mark and with other students and have that live synchronous experience. So it's all of the above. That's great. Now, Mark, it, I know you mentioned, obviously, we talked a little bit about the experiential learning component of the program, and that is a true differentiator. Are there other things that make the program stand out from your viewpoint? So Kate talked a little bit about this issue um, that we wanted to incorporate into the curriculum and the activities, which we call societal challenges. I think that's another thing that really stands out. Rather than just kind of having, okay, here's one course to talk about it, societal challenges are impacting the decisions that are getting made in corporations, in government, personal decisions. What we want to be able to do is help students understand kind of how to get the information they need to make good decisions, what that process might look like, and how societal challenges now really have a seat at the table. One example to think about is that right now there are tremendous challenges in, let's call it, um, finding, hiring, and retaining workers. Whatever industry you want to talk about, from uh, essential workers to knowledge workers, who could also be essential, I guess, um, to kind of just about anybody. So how, how do you work with people to allow that to happen? Well, it turns out that younger demographics, the folks typically who might be going through this program in many cases, have different values as it relates to um, these challenges. It could be uh, climate change. It could be diversity, equity, and inclusion. They want to work for companies that reflect their values in many cases. This is a much newer phenomenon than has been there before. One of the things that we do, and, and Kate was talking about asynchronous and synchronous, we're recording a lot of industry panels to have discussions about these topics. Sometimes it's bonus content. So again, if you've done your work, you can get access to it. But really, it's meant to help people realize that the, the folks that are making decisions around the table, that's changing, number one. Um, I can give you some great examples. It, when I was doing a lot of work early in my career, the highest level person in supply chain was called the director of purchasing. Today, right. it's the chief supply chain officer who might be kind of the number two or number three person in an organization. We had human, re human resources, the HR group. And again, begrudgingly, maybe they had a big seat at the table. Now, the chief people officer is all about these different kinds of experiences. And so decision-making is changing. We want to help students feel like they understand what's going on, understand the inputs, and as a result, are there to be able to make better decisions. And in a world right now where I think resiliency, the ability to adapt, the ability not to become a deer in headlights when a new scenario uh, confronts you, these are skills that employers are saying, this is what I want. I want people to be able to come into my organization equipped to work with that, to know what they need to do to make good decisions. Those are the folks who are gonna be great employees. And frankly, if I can find those, which is a challenge, I wanna reward them and retain them and figure out how to do that. Right. Now, Kate, um, one of the things that often comes up in discussions of online programs uh, is what sacrifices someone might have to make to go online versus on campus. Mm -hmm. And typically they think they have to sacrifice some networking, some mentorship, and some uh, career development opportunities. And I want you to tell us why that's not true with your program. Well, okay, so yes and no. <laughs> I'm happy to tell you, and no, it's not true. It's not true everywhere. No is my favorite word, by the way. Um, <laughs> so we, we've absolutely said no to the fact or the, the premise that you need to sacrifice. Is it the same? No, it's not the same. 
but is it available, the opportunity to network and to build your network and to, to grow beyond the um, curricular only learning? Of course it is. So it, it's lots of these opportunities. It's the, the um, synchronous live sessions. It's the opportunity to come to events that we have. I mean, Northeastern is a global university. We have a network across the country and, and in Europe right now. So we, we have opportunities to bring people together where they are. So if, if we have a cluster of students in Seattle, can we bring them together and invite them to networking opportunities in Seattle? Of course we can. We're we're in London, we're in Toronto, we're everywhere. So <laughs> which is an exciting opportunity. Um and so there there are lots of things that our students can do and participate in. We also have 16 years, well probably 14 years worth of alumni from our online programs. So yes, we've changed some of what we're doing, but there's still alumni of DeMore McKim and of Northeastern, and that's a tremendous network. Um, and a really, I would have to say, very generous network. And so far as people being responsive and you know welcoming the outreach of students and others, if you're exploring an opportunity at an organization and you see there are fellow Northeastern alumni there, you know, that outreach is, is very, very, I've never heard anybody say no. And I've been at the university longer than I'm willing to admit on a recorded webinar, but a really long time. And I, you know, it, that has been uh, a tremendous opportunity. And then finally, into the program, we have built opportunities for students to opt in to in-person live experiences. So we, we run a number of both international and domestic field seminar courses, which are week-long immersions, either domestically inside the US at one of our network campuses or internationally in a, in a foreign location. And our online students are welcome to participate in those. We're part of the Washington campus, which is a consortium of business schools in the Washington DC that really focuses on the intersection of um, business and government. Uh, we just had students return from uh, an early January experience uh, at the Washington campus. And to an individual, they come back and say it's one of the most impactful things they, they ever could have imagined doing. So students can participate in the Washington campus. They can do a domestic field seminar. They can do an international field seminar. Um, we have in the past, and now that we're hopefully three years into learning how to live with a new virus, we bring them to the Boston campus. Yeah, people like to come here. We've got a really nice bookstore full of swag. So <laughs> they wanna come you know, to the, to the main campus. Great, we, we can build and have built week long courses for them here. So where students choose to engage, there's opportunity to engage. We don't make any of these um, live synchronous in-person courses required because we know that just doesn't work for everyone. But I will say the feedback we get from students who participate is typically, oh, you should require everyone to do this. This was great. <laughs> it's like, well, we required it. They said, oh, I never would have applied. So we have that whole circular logic going on. <laughs> right. You know, if I could add one more piece to that too, John. Yeah, um, please do. Okay. There is this network of outside experts that we're starting to build also um, who are participating initially asynchronously, but there are CEOs that are giving regular feedback. And there is an opportunity for students to get just kind of recorded feedback on some of the things, but there's a live option also. They can opt in to have their whole team, or if not the whole team can make it, some team members to join that session. And here wow. from this newly built network of outside folks, um, who in, in this case are CEOs or have been CEOs, to give them some, some ideas, some feedback, and that becomes a new network that starts to build as well, which is something we want to cultivate internally too. Well, that's a unique aspect of the program. I don't think anyone's doing that. We're starting. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Mark, I wonder if you might address how you help develop leadership skills uh, in the students. We've talked about a lot of different things here, but not necessarily leadership. And, uh, and that's a core element of a good MBA program. How do you do it? So I think I, when I view leadership, there are kind of two aspects of it. There's kind of the individual piece 
and is more the um, the influence and getting along piece, more of a team orientation. And, and as I mentioned before, the reality is people, even if you're an individual contributor, you're working with a team needing to have influence on that. So we're trying to build both sets of skills. One of the things we're doing in the Experience Powered course is when you're put on into a group, each person is assigned a C-suite role. You're in charge, you're the chief people officer, the chief marketing, chief supply chain, chief financial, chief strategy, chief sales, whatever it is. Students need to kind of hone those skills, understand what that means. What's the responsibility that's here? Um, how am I going to lead a team in my function? And they need to figure out how to work together with their team to determine what they need to do to move forward, to give that recommendation to the CEO, to make good decisions. Um, one of the uh, activities that I have uh, coming up in my next course is I'm saying to them, you, you as a team are going to need to do market research. Make the case for what research you're going to do and in what area. Be lovely to do them all, but you don't have the resources. Figure it out, folks. How are you going to work together to determine what you can get, how you're going to get it, who's going to work on it, all those different pieces. So they're kind of um, learning about functional requirements as a leader, and then they're taking it across more broadly. The other thing that I'd add is because um, we are set up this way and it's online, people come from all over the world, different backgrounds, different cultures, you know, different ideas. And whether you're, you're, you're in a different location or you're in kind of, I'll call it a headquarters location, the reality of work is that you are going to have teammates all over the world, come from different backgrounds, they're awake at different hours, they bring different styles, skills, and, and activities. We're kind of bringing that to the fore right now, right here, and giving you a chance not only to practice it and do it, but to get some outside feedback, you know, basically without, without risk. <laughs> People guiding you and saying, hey, right. maybe that wasn't the best approach on this one. What if you could try it this way? Um, you know, a great example that we used is, you know, going through this particular one. I, I, I won't give this away unless lots of folks watch this, but customer understanding turned out to be, in my opinion, the one area where each, each group and each of the projects needed to do more work. And to be able to give them that feedback early in the process made a huge difference versus giving them at the end saying, you know, you don't understand your customers well enough. Giving them that insight in the beginning led to, for example, someone went to a location that had Amazon just walk out technology. They tried it themselves. And then they stood outside and interviewed a pile of people <laughs> to get their feedback on how it went. That was wow. fabulous. And then they shared that with their group. And then when they made their presentation, the other group saw that and was like, wow, what a great way I could have done that. Thank you. That's great. And, and I should mention something that we haven't even talked about yet. And that is the fact that you brought the price of the program down significantly. The earlier program before the reinvention uh, cost something like $85,000, I recall. And you slashed the price by $40,000 to $45,000, which makes this brand new program a real bargain in my estimation. Uh, isn't that right, Kate? I would agree. I would agree. Yeah, yeah, we did. We brought the price down. Um, you know, and again, I think to Mark's point, understanding who our market is, what our competition is, and what we can deliver. We are not the least expensive online MBA program. We are certainly not the most expensive online MBA program, but we are a tremendous bargain. You get more for your dollars with us in, in so much as, you know, again, the, the things we talked about earlier, the flexibility, letting the program fit into your life, the experiential opportunities, the access to mentors and feedback, the access to the network, the access to our career center, all of those things, the experiential education piece of it, I think a lot of people think Northeastern co-op, great for undergrads for their first job, right? You get to test the waters before you enter the workforce. We're taking experiential ed and bringing it to the graduate level and say, okay, well, how do you test the higher, more senior level? How do you test your legs in a leadership role to your point, John, or or something outside your area of comfort and expertise. If you've been raised in the financial services line of a business, but you want a more general manager, 
show me that you can do it. So we're giving students that opportunity while they maintain their employment to actually show their organization or potentially a new organization that they do have what it takes to span into a more general uh, leadership role. That's and a pretty good bargain for 45K. Um, that's right. And for all of you out there who want to read a little bit more about this, we did a story a few months ago uh, called Bringing Experiential Learning to an Online MBA. It's on Poets and Quants. Look it up. Meantime, Kate, how would they get in touch with you or a member of your team to learn more about the program and to apply? This will come as a shock, but everything you need is online, right? It's in a, on our go. website. Uh, it, you can either look you know, quite easily at northeastern.edu or Demore McKim. Um, you search for Demore McKim, it'll bring you right to the business school website and our programs are all there. There's contact us information, there's request more information buttons, all that stuff. And we will certainly follow up with you. Uh, give us your phone number, we'll call you, I promise. Fantastic. Kate, Mark, thank you for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, John. Always great to see you.